Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, November 13th, 2023. Hope you had an awesome weekend. Thank you so much for kicking off a little bit of your week with me here today. And today in history, it's November 13th, 1732, I believe, John Dickinson was born. At the time of the founding, at the time of the American Revolution, he was absolutely famous. He earned the nickname the Penman of the American Revolution. Excuse me, but few people actually know him today. He's almost totally forgotten. And I'd call him probably maybe the most important founder that most people have never heard of. And in fact, when a lot of people hear about them, not always, but when they hear about him from mainstream historians, you basically get an interest, like they go deeper into this, but the lead, the overview that most people look at right at the top, the first paragraph goes kind of like this. And this is right from Thomas Jefferson's, well, captured Monticello uh, website. And they write about John Dickinson. Best because Dickinson and Jefferson worked pretty closely together on a number of things. And we'll see at the end of the episode here today what Thomas Jefferson had to say about him later in life. But best known today for his refusal to vote for independence, John Dickinson was among the most influential leaders in the Continental Congress. Born into a wealthy slave-owning family, Dickinson was raised in Maryland and Delaware and studied law at the Inns of Court in London. So basically, the, the the takeaway that I think most people would get from that introduction, rather than probably bigger picture things or a different perspective on how this can be this story can be told, which I think you'll hear from me here today, is basically you got a rich slave own, owning British lawyer that was opposed to independence. He wasn't even on board with it. And I'm going to do my best to share a different approach, covering some of his top works during the revolution, maybe in another year. And I've been doing a number of episodes uh, throughout the years now, <laughs> throughout the years on this show, covering Dickinson on or around his birthday. And I think next year or the year after, I'll probably do one covering his work because we could call him also maybe uh, the father of the Articles of Confederation. He was one of the lead drafters of the Articles of Confederation, and he was a supporter of the Constitution as well some years later. So his takes on that might be interesting as well. But let's start out with uh, some of the things that he did. And of course, he was one of the biggest leaders amongst the patriots against the Stamp Act. And of course, the Stamp Act was awful, 1765. And he really promoted a peaceful, non-compliance approach to dealing with bad acts by a far off government, by any government, really. This is how you deal with it. Uh, because if you submit to them and you comply and then you hope you can convince them to stop doing this stuff later on, it's really not going to work too well because as Je uh, Jefferson, as Dickinson called it, you establish the precedent. Once they can enforce one thing, they will always try to use that as a baseline to expand. And he even warns, and I'll discuss this a little bit later in the show, against the smallest infraction on a constitution because that is the most dangerous one. That's the one that's easiest for them to establish and build upon. So here's how he put it in his broadside against the Stamp Act. I'm sure this was primarily distributed around Philadelphia in, in Pennsylvania, but it could have gone broader than that. If you comply with the act, he said, by using stamped papers, you fix, you rivet perpetual chains upon your unhappy country. You unnecessarily, voluntarily establish the detestable precedent, which those who have forged your fetters ardently wished for to varnish the future exercise of this new claimed authority. So every small step to John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, every small step against your charter, against your constitution, against your liberty is a baseline for them to expand more. And you cannot comply with that stuff because, well, you're going to run into a lot of problems. And so here's how Dickinson summed it up. The Stamp Act, therefore, is to be required... 
Let me start it again. John Dickinson put it this way. The Stamp Act, therefore, is to be regarded only as an experiment of your disposition. To Dickinson, acts that violate your liberty, acts that violate your constitution are tests of the strength and resolve of your support for liberty. Because, he said, if you quietly bend your necks to that yoke, you prove yourselves ready to receive any bondage to which your lords and masters shall please to subject you. And I put those, if you look at, if you're watching on the screen here, you can see in the uh, the image that we made of that quote of the last part, if you quietly bend your necks, highlighted both lords and masters because in the original Dickinson also emphasized that. It was kind of a jab to say, if you're going to bend your knee to this three pence tax, this small tax, whatever it may be, if you're going to bend your knee on that, you've got lords and masters willing and ready to ramp it up for that. Now, as I mentioned, he played a very key role in the overall response, not just locally, but overall response to the Stamp Act outside of Pennsylvania. He was one of the leading guys in the uh, Stamp Act Congress, and he was the primary drafter of the uh, the Stamp Act Congress's response to it. It's the late reg regulations respecting Oh, those are two of them. He wrote the late regulations respecting the British colonies considered. That's one, discussing the issue. And then he was the primary drafter of the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, which was passed unanimously by the Stamp Act Congress in 1765. It was basically 14 points in that document. I've got it linked here. I've got it up here on the screen. It will be included in the show notes over at 10th Amendment Center.com slash Path to Liberty so you can read it. It's 14 points that oppose the taxation, the internal taxation, but also in support Port of trial by jury. Here's how they put it over at Rev War and Beyond. This is a nice, just quick take. The stamp, and this is why this is a big deal. The Stamp Act Congress was significant because, with the exception of the Albany Congress, that was 1754, this was the first act of joint cooperation between the colonies, and it issued the first official statement issued jointly by the colonies in opposition to an act of British rule. Of course, we had people like James Otis Jr. in response uh, to the um, uh, to the writs of assistance in 1761 and a number of other people in response to that. And of course, opposition to the Sugar Act and then Patrick Henry's resolves against the Stamp Act. But this was kind of the first one, the first united response against the British drafted by John Dickinson. Uh, the other real famous one, the one that really gave him his name, he was also already pretty well known at this point, but was in 1767. He wrote a series of letters against the next uh, attack on liberty. That is the Townsend Act. Well, it wasn't the next one. There was an interim one that I'll get to in a moment. In 1767, he uh, against the Townsend Act was a smaller tax. Uh, in a series of letters, 12 of them, letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania, which I've mentioned a number of response uh, times on this show. And, and here's how they put it in the introduction over at Liberty Fund. The publication of the letters was, as Philip Davidson believes, the most brilliant literary event of the entire revolution. And the revolution being that period of a radical change in the viewpoints of the people from 1760-ish to 1775 when the shot heard around the world happened in April. Uh, now, a lot of people think the revolution was the war for independence. Many of the founding generation would have vehemently disagreed with that. I'm not sure what Philip thinks about that. Forrest MacDonald adds, and Forrest MacDonald is one of the leading historians of the last century, their impact and their circulation were unapproached by any publication of the revolutionary period except Thomas Paine's Common Sense. And I've mentioned this many times on this show. Letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania were the most widely read documents on the American view of liberty up until that publication of Common Sense in January of 1776. And this is where he really got the name The Penman of the American Revolution. So he was very, very much in demand to do more, more writing. Now, here from Wikipedia, they say the British officials, partly on the advice, this is a little background here, British officials, partly on the advice of Benjamin Franklin, believed that while American colonists would not accept internal taxes levied by Parliament, such as those in the Stamp Act, they thought they kind of changed the game a little bit because they were pushing back. There was so much resistance, so much nullification of the Stamp Act happening, noncompliance, even getting officials in government to be able to oppose that. So they thought they had the, the best approach. They would accept some external taxes, such as import duties. However, John Dickinson in these papers argued that any taxes— whether internal or external, laid upon the colonies by Parliament for the purpose of raising revenue rather than regulating trade were unconstitutional. He pointed out 
in these papers that basically taxing for revenue, and if you think about that in relationship to the Affordable Care Act, I guess that's kind of how they approached it as well. Taxing for revenue was seen as very radical, a very radical move by the British Parliament. It's something that hadn't been done, according to Dickinson, in over a century. I think it was like 150 years from what I recall. And despite the fact that there was no written constitution, you notice that they say unconstitutional. Every time we mention this uh, about the revolutionary period, we get a handful of people saying, what do you mean unconstitutional? Something can't be unconstitutional as if the view of a constitution is only that those first written constitutions that came out of the American Revolution and the War for Independence. No, the British system was an unwritten constitution, and that's part of the reason why they wanted and which really gave a lot of latitude to the people in power. That's why they wanted to have a written constitution. But you could still refer to something as unconstitutional, and they did it all the time. Dickinson repeatedly called the Stamp, uh, the, the stamp Act, but the uh, Townsend Acts, unconstitutional in this series of letters. Now, here's some just, I think, important stuff here as well. Uh, the argument, this argument they put, it, oh, this is over at Wiki again, implied that sovereignty, final authority, sovereignty in the British Empire was divided, with parliament's, parliament's power limited in certain spheres, such as the taxation of the colonies, and with lesser bodies, such as colonial assemblies, uh, exercising sovereign power in other spheres. These views were a significant departure from prevailing British views on sovereignty. They saw sovereignty, final authority, as the king in parliament. They felt that they had, of course, power over the colonies in all cases whatsoever by their very right. Human beings could not have final authority over themselves. This was totally up to government, so far beyond uh, what, uh, well... This is a much different view that they were taking in this very radical revolution. These views were a significant departure from prevailing British views on sovereignty as a central, indivisible power, and they implied that the British Empire did not function as a unitary nation. This is a very much a precursor to the structure of what we got in the Articles of Confederation and, to a lesser degree, in the Constitution for the United States. It's a very much a Tenth Amendment approach, pre-Tenth Amendment approach, if we're going to call it something like that, that Dickinson was taking. Basically, like, there's a line in the sand. You're authorized to do this stuff, and if you go beyond that, well, there's got to be a response because you're violating our rights. So, anyways, a little further here. Here are some uh, quick highlights. From letter six, well, which one is this? He's talking about, I think this one is, I got to scroll up and see which letter. Uh, I don't know. It's a long one. But this is an important piece here. He's saying some person, this is what I was saying at the beginning. He was not as concerned by big violations of the compact, of the Constitution, big violations of liberty, because that would rouse people to action. Now, of course, we have that all the time today. Unfortunately, we don't live in a society that thinks about liberty first. Liberty is our primary object. Uh, liberty as the foundation, as Dickinson put it earlier, some years earlier, the foundation of all the rest. So we don't have that approach today. But at the time, even if uh, in many areas they weren't uh, following through, the thought process was to focus on liberty first. And so he thought that a small attack on it was far more dangerous. And here's how he explained it. Some persons may think this act of no consequence because the duties are so small. A fatal error. That is the very circumstance most alarming to me. To John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, the smallest attack on liberty, the smallest violation of the Constitution, is the most dangerous one. And here's how he put it. For I am convinced that the authors of this law would never have obtained an act to raise so trifling a sum as it must do had they not intended by it to establish a precedent for future use, to console themselves, to console ourselves, with the smallness of the duties is to walk deliberately into the snare that is set for us, praising the neatness of the workmanship. And so I think that's letter six. So for Dickinson, it's all about precedent. And he saw 
really, really small moves to set a new precedent has probably far more intentional and far more uh, long-term thinking on the people by the people in power. And I think if we start approaching things like that today, we often heard from people uh, in the last few years in response to the bump stock ban, so-called Second Amendment supporters, all day long. We spent a lot of time opposing this because it doesn't matter if you are uh, an enthusiast or if you're an expert and you think it's a so-called kitty toy, because that's the kind of thing uh, we would hear. Oh, that's just a kitty toy. Who cares? They're not even thinking about it. It doesn't affect me. I would never own such a thing as what we heard so many times. So who cares? We're not going to oppose that. We got the Second Amendment president, so everything's cool because he's not going after the stuff that I want or I own. But that's the problem. Once you establish that detestable precedent by going after something that people won't resist on as much, they're going to build on it. And we see that happening. The next dude, of course, uses some of the same mentality. Uh, so here from letter number 11, again, he talks about a precedent, warning it again. He said the late act of parliament is only designed to be a precedent whereon the future vassalage of these colonies may be established. And I see over in the comment, Floyd Lo comments on YouTube, Floyd Looney makes a really good point. Little by little, you can boil the frog. Not sure why anyone wants to boil frogs, though, of course. But people with power treat us all as something to control, to what, discardable. We're just... Uh, all throw away. If, if it's something that really attacks our livelihood and our liberty, they'll do it slowly sometimes and very quickly. Now, John Adams, uh, in the years leading up to uh, the Declaration of Independence, he talked about how encroachment on the Constitution is like a cancer. It grows and grows, but once it starts growing, it gets faster and faster every hour. So we're really ramping up the speed, but we can't just look at the fast growth of power today as the precedent that was not... If we don't ignore all the precedent that happened over the last couple of centuries. Really, if you go all the way back to 1791 for precedent with the first national bank, then we can understand the source of our problems. And it's a big thing to deal with. It is a very big one. And here he is again. He said, I, upon the whole, for my part, and this is again from letter 11, I regard the late act, the Townsend Acts, as an experiment made of our disposition. It is a bird sent out over the waters to discover where, whether the waves that lately agitated this part of the world with such violence have yet subsided. So they recognized, and Dickinson correctly, correctly analyzed what was going on. There was so much resistance to the Stamp Act in 1765 that they were never really able to get it implemented at all. It was nullified, and by early 1766, they had to repeal it. At the same time, they passed the Declaratory Act, which I'll get into in a moment. I've been getting uh, into that quite a bit lately. But the, here he is. Here they are in the following year. They've planned out there. They're kind of testing the waters to see whether the people will resist again. Do it a little different approach and maybe you can get away with it, but then establish a precedent to do more and more and more. Now, I'm going to link to all this stuff. Well, Alan Mosley is going to organize the blog post like he has been for the past few weeks. Uh, I don't know, probably even longer than that now. I really am grateful for all the work that he's been doing uh, on a very timely basis after every episode. He gets that organized with all the links and all the other different platforms we're on. And then I'll get that published in a couple hours after the live stream is done here over at 10th Amendment Center com slash path to liberty. And in case we're missing from one of your favorite platforms one of these days, you can go there and find out all the other ones that are on. Of course, we live stream on the big uh, big platforms like uh, X and Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitch and somewhere else, I'm sure. But we also live stream over at odyssey.com where we get a lot of great conversations going. Small numbers, but lots of really awesome, thoughtful stuff. And over at rumble.com, which uh, a little bit less on that, but uh, pretty cool to see that growing there as well. And we're on all the major audio platforms for the podcast edition as well. Again, 10th Amendment Center.com slash Path to Liberty. And while I'm here, I'm going to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. I appreciate you being here. We're celebrating happy birthday to John Dickinson, the penman of the American Revolution. There's Haji and Larry Clark, Cheriton Farmer, uh, Jay Bowser, King Nobody, Clay Kent, Senator DT, John, uh, Mike Now No over on Facebook, M. Gabriel, Channel 3, 
Floyd, as I mentioned earlier, MRGF, 12 Pack, Snowfish, and a bunch of other people. I appreciate you guys being here. Again, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one, I hope you guys are finding this interesting. I find a Dickinson a very, very interesting character. One of my favorites to study and a lot of the viewpoints that he shared. But let's get back to it. One of the things that he talked about in these letters, and I think is very important, that we don't address today, because so many people still, even though we live under the largest government in history, they think this is America is the land of the free. We still have the freedom. Bolden, you're still doing the show. They're not shutting you down. You can still, you know, exercise your Second Amendment rights, supposedly, as long as you get permission in many situations or you don't go beyond certain limits. And they still think we live in the land of the free, even though it's the largest government in history. And Dickinson had a really interesting approach that I don't think anyone has today. Now, I hold it because I've learned from it, and hopefully you will uh, find it interesting as well. Who, what makes a free people? And he asked this question here in letter number six, for who are a free people? Not those, wrote Dickinson, over whom government is reasonable and equitably exercised, but those who live under a government so constitutionally checked and controlled that proper provision is made against it being otherwise exercised. Otherwise exercised. So for John Dickinson, a free people are not those people who just happen to be living under a powerful government that isn't using its power to violate your rights. In fact, a government could totally stop violating your rights and you could be able to exercise all your natural rights without getting permission from government. But you would not be qualified as a free people under this view if it still claimed the power to do other stuff under different administrations. Because it is not so constitutionally checked and controlled that as soon as it tries to go beyond its limits, it's really just a matter of luck. You're relying on the right people in power to do the right thing, and that doesn't work out too well. That's what people have done for generations here in these United States, turning the former federal republic into a consolidated empire, a blob of centralized power, where they have uh, they claim the power and they don't always exercise it to monitor everything you read, say, do, ever all your communications. It tells you what they tell you, what kind of uh, tools you can use for your self defense, how uh, much water you should have in your toilet. I mean, seriously, what kind of plant you can grow in your backyard and whether they're going to punish you for it or not. This is not the definition of a free people. According to John Dickinson, this is, in essence is a population on its knees begging for permission. Here's another one from letter 12. He points out that slavery is ever preceded by sleep. So if you happen to live under a very powerful government and you get the people in power that do things that you like, you generally, this is what we see, maybe not you and not me, but many, many people just go totally to sleep. And then all of a sudden the next dude gets in power and they do use that same power or they build upon it and they do the opposite. And people are wondering like, what? How did this happen? How could we have allowed this to destroy our democracy is the types of things that we hear. And they think it's just the wrong person, the wrong team in power, rather than recognizing that the power in and of itself has always been the problem. You're only a free people when government can't even find a way to exercise that power, whether it's following the rules that are given to it on paper, which I would argue really never happens. Uh, Roger Sherman basically said a bill of rights, a government will only follow a bill of rights. It would be like a honeymoon of a new couple. Like everything's wonderful, but over time they're going to start crossing the Line. That's, well, maybe in a, his relationships. So who are a free people? I covered that in an article episode. We've discussed this. And number one, I'm going to link this, who are a free people, uh, an article from earlier this year based on another episode that we did. Uh, this is back in January of 2023. That'll be over in the show notes. Here from letter number nine. I'm going to get to some other things as well here in just a moment. Letter from a, Letter nine, no free people ever existed or can ever exist without keeping to use a common but strong impression, the purse, purse strings in their own hands. So to be a free people to John Dickinson, you have to have the purse strings in the hands of the people. He said, where this is the case, they have a constitutional check upon the administration, which may thereby be brought into order without violence. 
So how do you deal with government power without resorting to violence? To Dickinson, the people ultimately have to hold the purse strings. Now, under the system we have today, the representatives of the people are horrible, so that tells us that the people themselves are willing to choose people who are terrible with the purse strings, clearly. Anyways, Dickinson continues, but where such a power is not lodged in the people, he highlights the people. He didn't say representatives, but I think that's the implication here. Oppression proceed. So where the power over the purse strings to John Dickinson is not lodged in the people, oppression proceeds uncontrolled in its career till the governed, transported into rage, seek redress in the midst of blood and confusion. So allowing government to have basically unlimited power over the people's money leads to total destruction of a society. I thought that was a really interesting point as well. And here from Rob Nadelson's great article, The Message of the Farmer Letters, he said, although the farmer necessarily focused on taxes, that was the big argument, it was against the Townsend Acts, Dickinson addressed other political questions as well. One was how a free people should respond to government usurpations. And this is kind of a theme if you look at what he had to say against the Stamp Act. Use noncompliance. That's how, if government can't enforce stuff because there's too many people violating its acts, then it's going to have to back down. We see this happen on a number of things today. Citizens, he, uh, he writes, should oppose small usurpations immediately to prevent them from acquiring the force of precedent. And from letter 12, a perpetual jealousy regarding liberty is absolutely required in all free states. That was the precursor to slavery is ever preceded by sleep. If you allow them to get away with something because you like the person doing it or you're making excuses, well, it's different when my guy does it, my team does it, versus how they did it, which is what we hear constantly, especially on foreign policy all the time. As soon as you allow them to do one thing, you're giving them the next person who hates you the same power to do that, the opposite, and more. Anyways, Rob continues. However, opposition should pre proceed cautiously. Dickinson was definitely a moderate when it came to how to deal with government. There was step by step. Letter three, he writes, contended that citizens must first petition for redress of grievances. Only if petitioning was unsuccessful should citizens proceed to peaceful civil disobedience. And only if both those steps failed should they employ force. So it's kind of a, a ramp it up type of approach. He also talked quite a bit about property rights and consent. He was really a Lockean at that time. And here's how he put it in letter 12 again. Let these truths be indelibly impressed on our minds that we cannot be happy without being free. Freedom is the source of all of our happiness. It's the freedom, uh, freedom is the source of our security. Freedom is the source of our prosperity, according to John Dickinson. He said, we cannot be free without being secure in our property. And we cannot be secure in our property if without our consent, others may, as by right, take it away. So the foundation of everything is liberty, is freedom. But the foundation of freedom is property rights to John Dickinson. And I covered <laughs> so many places we've discussed Dickinson's farmer letters. Here's an episode from a couple of years ago in February 2021, almost three years ago now, Lessons for Liberty from John Dickinson and the Farmer Letters. That will be included in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center.com slash Path to Liberty. I guess I'm running a little long today, but hopefully you guys are enjoying this stuff. I've got a, a few more things that I want to cover here as well. Now, before all these letters were published, he wrote them all at once. He didn't do kind of like uh, what we know of of Publius and the Federalists, for example, the Anti-Federalists. It was a back and forth conversation. He wrote this whole series right away near the end of 1767, and they were published uh, sequentially over time. But before they were all fully published, Dickinson sent them over to James Otis. It's not like they were doing this in isolation. He actually sent them complete to James Otis Jr. and Samuel Adams in Boston, recognizing the leadership that they had against the Stamp Act and how many people trusted them uh, to, to kind of take on the torch. He urged them to take the torch of the message of these farmer, farmer letters and run with it. They certainly did. The story is pretty awesome. I'm not going to get into that here. I just wanted to mention it because I'm going to link to another, or Alan is going to link to another episode in the show notes, Otis Adams Dickinson, the Massachusetts Circular Letter. It's an important part of the overall history. It's an awesome story uh, that I think you'll enjoy as well. So the next thing that uh, Dickinson covered was an, 
That was the Declaratory Act of 1766, which is what they passed right after repealing the Stamp Act. It was a slap in the face, basically saying, okay, we couldn't get this one implemented, but we still have the power to do whatever the hell we want. They basically said it that way. They said they had the power over the colonies in all cases whatsoever. If you've been listening to the show, I've been mentioning it a lot in the last couple of weeks, discussing how Alexander Hamilton... Uh, even James Madison at one point really called for the new general or federal government to have power over the states in all cases whatsoever, and how Jefferson had the total opposite approach. He really complained about this in the Kentucky Resolution that if uh, of 1798, that if you gave them power to go beyond the limits, you're basically giving them limits of the Constitution. You're basically giving them power in all cases whatsoever. You just have to come up with the right situation, the right excuse, and they will do whatever they want. Now, of course, everyone who gets in the power ends up doing this. So Dickinson took on the Declaratory Act in a paper, an essay on the constitutional power of Great Britain over the colonies in America. Again, discussing constitutional power of an unwritten constitution. This was published in 1774, and this was, he did mention the Declaratory Act in his Farmer Letters as well, but in a precursor to his positions regarding the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, he repeatedly hit on the message that government must have limits. He said things like a line that is expressly drawn. If we hear the debates over ratification of the Constitution, we hear almost all of them saying they're only going to have those powers that are expressly delegated to them. Anything else is not there. He talked about having a boundary between the powers of Parliament and the powers of the colonies. This is Dickinson in 1774 and earlier Patrick Henry did the same type of thing in 1765 against in his resolves against the Stamp Act as well. But here we are, these early revolutionaries. It's not like they came up with this idea of delegated reserve powers out of nowhere. This was a big part of the revolution that they only were able to do certain things. Anything else is going to respond, going to be responded with with a great deal of opposition. Now he also here's another interesting quote. Uh, that I from that paper in 1774. Liberty, life, or property with no consistency of words or ideas. Wait, liberty, life, or property can, with no consistency of words or ideas, be termed a right of the possessors, while others have a right of taking them away at pleasure. So if government can do what government wants to do whenever government wants to do it, and only government can determine if government did the wrong thing, you have no rights. That is not a right at all, according to John Dickinson. And that's basically what we live under today. The way that people treat the federal government is that the fe all federal acts are supreme until the federal government determines that the federal government made a mistake, whether it's through the courts or through repealing one of their own acts. And this is not, again... The definition of freedom, this is a population on its knees begging for permission. Now, he also, in that paper in 1774, explored the question of when is resistance lawful, and that gets a little bit to what Rob had to say uh, in his paper or his article as well. Now, the other one that I think this is one of my favorite documents ever written, uh, this is uh, Thomas Jefferson first drafted it, and then it was modified by John Dickinson. The Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, July 6, 1775. This is just mere months after Lexington and Concord, and they're explaining. This was passed unanimously by the Continental Congress, and they're explaining to the world why are we fighting. Why are we fighting back? What's going on? And this is what I think is really interesting because we hear so much about a declaration of grievances. We know that the declaration of the First Continental Congress in the fall of 1774, they listed all the stuff that were problematic, and they did a little bit in this document as well. But here's the really, really kind of, this is an important point. They say, but why should we enumerate our injuries in detail? By one statute, it is declared that Parliament can of right make laws to bind us in all cases whatsoever. What is to defend us against so enormous, so unlimited a power? So why even list all of the things that you have problems with if by one statute they can claim complete and total power? Anything else that they do is just an outgrowth of that view of unlimited power. And here's how they put it, Dickinson and Jefferson. Our attachment to no nation upon earth should supplant our attachment to liberty. So good. And they wrapped it up with this. This is in the second last paragraph, talking again why they were fighting, why they were fighting back. This was a defensive fight. In our own native land, in defense of the freedom that is our birthright. Again, 
the rights and the freedoms that you have are from the nature of your birth. They come from your creator. They come from natural law, natural rights. They come from God, however you want to describe it. They don't come from government. They don't come from charters. Those are declarations of pre-existing rights. In our own native land, in defense of the freedom that is our birthright and which we ever enjoyed till the late violation of it, for the protection of our property acquired solely by the honest industry of our forefathers and ourselves against violence actually offered, we have taken up arms. We shall lay them down when hostilities shall cease on the part of the aggressors, and all danger of their being renewed shall be removed and not before. That's pretty hardcore for a guy who some historians want us to believe just opposed independence uh, without thinking of the context. Now, here from an interesting article by Mike Meharry, it's one thing to talk about fighting for liberty. It's another thing to put your money where your mouth is. And John Dickinson did just that. Mike writes, despite his refusal, now he did refuse to sign the Declaration of Independence. Most people today would take the view if they knew about this. Oh, he was he wanted to stay with the British. He was with Hamilton, really. Hamilton, even though he was... Well, that's Hamilton's always another story, but he had some fantasies about the British system and he wanted to kind of at some point after uh, independence, he kind of, uh, you know, dreamt about going back uh, with the British and reuniting. Dickinson was nothing like that at all. His was more of a strategic. If you think about his approach uh, on petitioning and the non-compliance, and then ramping up towards a violent resistance if necessary, his position was they weren't ready. He wanted like... <laughs> Thomas Paine put it in uh, Common Sense. You know, you got to organize a plan of government. And Articles of Confederation is what they passed in the Lee Resolution, saying they were going to have an Articles of Confederation. And Dickinson made the case that they should have foreign alliances in place and a new constitution, which he helped draft before they actually declared independence. He wanted everything, to, all the ducks to be in a row because he was concerned that they were going to get overwhelmed. Now, Thomas Paine, in the, the heat of the war, <laughs> the dead of the winter in December 1766, 1776, basically took the position that, look, okay, maybe we jumped the gun. I mean, this is maybe my perspective. Maybe we jumped the gun. Uh, you know, maybe things aren't going as well as we hoped for at this point, but we got to push on. So I think he was kind of acknowledging that maybe it was a little bit rushed. Maybe it was a, it was a tip of the hat to Dickinson. Maybe not. That might be me with some confirmation bias there. But anyways, despite his refusal, so Dickinson's uh, non-signing. He abstained. He didn't want it to be a, a no vote, so it was still unanimous. He abstained. His his abstaining was because he thought, based on his own principles, he couldn't support something that they didn't. He didn't think they were ready for. He was kind of the odd man out, without a doubt, and he lost quite a bit of popularity because of that. He even knew he would. Uh, but anyways, back to Mike. Despite his refusal to sign the Declaration of Independence. He was one of the few members of the first or second continental congresses to actually take up arms in the American Revolution. So here's the guy, that, the way it was described right at the beginning, slave owning, rich dude who opposed independence. But that is so understating the story. It doesn't explain why he voted no. He didn't even vote no. Why he did not vote yes on independence, but it does, also points out that he literally was the guy, one of the few who put his neck physically on the line to fight back, even though he was outvoted. It's not like he was like, well, this was my position. No, he basically said, this is the way everything's going. I still support what we're trying to do. I don't think it was the right strategy, but man, now that it's going down, I got to help out. So he didn't think it was uh, ripe. Time was ripe, but he definitely put his line, neck on the line. And uh, Mike goes with this. Despite his reticence to declare independence, Dickinson threw himself into the fight. He had already organized the first battalion of troops raised in Philadelphia. So he'd organized troops. In February 1776, he led a detachment of the so-called Associators to support colonial troops in New York. His unit was assigned to the Flying Camp, a mobile reserve that supported George Washington, with around 10,000 men who could be called up to join the Continentals holding New York City. And just days after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Dickinson resumed command and his regiment and marched to Elizabethtown, New Jersey, to help protect the area from a British incursion from Staten Island. So he definitely 
definitely pushed forward. Jane Calvert of the John Dickinson Writings Project. This is the foremost, she is the foremost expert on John Dickinson out there. I know Nadelson is really good on him too, but no one really has uh, really covered Dickinson more than Calvert. And she writes, Back in Delaware, Dickinson took two highly unusual steps. First, at the soonest opportunity after the Declaration, he liberated all the black people he enslaved. It wasn't a huge amount based in comparison to some of the southern plantation owners. But if you think going back to the beginning uh, of this episode where I discussed how that mainstream historian over at Monticello basically called him a slave owner. He was a rich guy. He did inherit slaves, but he liberated all of them. At first, it was just a conditional freedom, but within 10 years, he freed them all unconditionally. Of the leading founders, John Dickinson was the only one to put the theory of the Declaration of Independence into practice and free all those he enslaved during his lifetime, uh, up until 1786. Now, from Declaration through 1786, he was the only guy who did it. So, to refer to him at the beginning of this overview that they had at Monticello as some guy who owned slaves is really doing him injustice uh, of what he was, how he put himself on the line. He really was forward thinking in comparison to many others. Then determined to prove his patriot, patriotism, Dickinson did something nearly unheard of for a gentleman of his stature. He then enlisted in the Delaware militia as a private. So he had been passed up for a promotion by a couple other people previously. Uh, and then he was back home for some reason, whatever it may be. But then he re-enlisted as a militia fighting on the front lines near the end. Now, some people will think, oh, well, you know, obviously he was the one against independence. So the British weren't too concerned about him, but the British thought he was the number one enemy based on his leadership. Near the end of 1777, when the British took Philadelphia, Dickinson narrowly got Polly and their children out of their house before the British, who believed that Dickinson was, quote, the ruler of America, as John Adams put it, they burned his estate to the ground. So the British thought he was really dangerous. They thought his writing really made him kind of the leader. The ruler of America was the phrase that John Adams used. And Adams probably used a little bit of hyperbole there. But they went and burned his house to the ground as retribution. And here's how Meharry sums it up. While Dickinson didn't sign his name on the Declaration of Independence, pledging his life, fortune, and sacred honor in pursuit of liberty— he certainly put it all on the line anyway. He didn't just talk about freedom and independence. He took action to achieve it. And I want to sum it up here with Thomas Jefferson, who, when he heard about Dickinson's passing in 1808, here's how he put it. A more estimable, esti, a more estimable, wow, that is funny. I cannot say that. An awesome man or truer patriot could not have left us. Among the first of the advocates for the rights of his country when assailed by Great Britain, he continued to the last the orthodox advocate of the true principles of our new government, and his name will be consecrated in history as one of the great worthies of the revolution. And that's uh, a lot coming from Thomas Jefferson right there. I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. There is absolutely nothing that helps us do this work more every single day and get it out to more and more people, more than the financial faith and support of our members. If you got a couple of bucks of that depreciating, dirty government fiat, throw it our way. No one punches above their weight class better than the TAC. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Uh, we also have annual five-year and lifetime options. I know I'm doing a really long episode in comparison today, but I hope you guys really enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. You can help us spread the word, whether financially through a membership program or just doing some free, easy-peasy actions, like continue to leave comments, especially in the archive. Reviews on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform helps out smashing the like. Make sure you subscribe, uh, get notifications. All that stuff can trigger algorithms of the big platforms and tell them to show us to more people. Again, I really appreciate you being here. I hope you have an awesome day. I hope to see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.